Welcome to another episode of the Spoon Mob Podcast. This week I'm joined by Chef Jeff Miller. He's the executive chef and co-owner of Rosella in New York City. Rosella is a sushi restaurant that specializes in only really serving fish local to North America and especially out of the Northeast New England-ish area uh, is where they kind of primarily target fish from. They don't really bring anything in from Japan except for a handful of sake, but all the ingredients otherwise are local. The soy sauce that they use is from the States. Any miso that they use, like all this different stuff, um, they source from a bunch of places around Pennsylvania, upstate New York, Long Island, like all this stuff. So it's really fascinating that, you know, I love sushi, are doing great sushi, but they're doing it a completely different way against kind of the traditions where your traditional sushi is kind of this Edomai style where, you know, you get fish from Japan, you find the most premium kind of fish, tuna, whatever, and then you kind of cure it. Each fish has a different cure process, whether it's wrapped in kelp, whether it's salted, uh, frozen for three days, uh, flash frozen in a freezer, like whatever. There's all these different processes. And what Jeff is doing is kind of taking some of those methodologies and traditional ways of prepping fish, but applying it to American fish here. So, you know, mackerel and bass and bluefish and all this stuff. So it's super fascinating. It's a sustainably focused restaurant. They don't use anything that's being overfished. They use these different lists that they kind of monitor um, that are put out and make sure that, you know, nothing that they're serving is on a watch list or is on a high catch list or anything like that where overfishing is occurring or anything like and also still in season and and all that stuff so it's a really really interesting concept it runs counterculture to most of what the sushi industry is it's a different way of approaching it a different way of going about it but also in a weird way the future of sushi too as well Uh, You know, one of the things I ask a lot of people when we have a sushi chef on is what their thoughts are if they would work with lab grown fish, because that is something that is coming. There's a firm out of Virginia that's been doing it and and everything. It's years away. The texture's not right. The flavor's not right yet, but they're working on developing it and lab grown meats and stuff like that. That's something that's coming, but also with overfishing so much, whether it's off Japan or here in America too with, you know, cod and salmon. Like they didn't even have, I think, a sockeye salmon season in the Pacific Northwest this year. They canceled it completely because the population was too low. I remember a couple years ago, the water got too warm off of Long Island and it just killed all the scallops and there was no scallop season just because of the the water was too warm and everything died. So those things keep happening to different populations. And when that stuff continues to happen and continues to get more and more severe, you have to look for alternative ways to run your restaurant, but also highlight different things that are going on. And that's kind of what Jeff is doing at Rosella and will be continuing to do at these other concepts that he's going to be opening to as well. Rosella is going to expand into Maine, have an offshoot um, restaurant, but they're also going to open a couple other things in New York City, which we kind of talk about too as well in the podcast. So I always love having sushi chefs on. Uh, anytime I get the opportunity to get one of them on, I'm always down to do it. Uh, it's just, you know, one of my favorite things to eat. So part of the food industry that I love. You can follow Jeff on Instagram. His handle is at Jeffrey Peffrey. You can also follow the restaurant Rosella on Instagram. It's at Rosella Sushi. They'll be putting out new posts once the other concepts that they're getting ready to open launch. They'll have, I'm sure, dedicated Instagram handles too as well. So make sure to follow Rosella. All that stuff will go up there. Make sure to follow us on Instagram too as well, at Spoon Mob. You can check us out on other social medias, but mainly we use Instagram. Check out the website, SpoonMob.com. Different profiles for different chefs, any updates since they've been on the podcast, food photos, uh, wine photos, all that stuff is up there. There's a contact box where you can write in questions, comments, feedback too as well through the website. Or you can hit us up directly either through our Instagram direct message or spoonmob at yahoo.com is our email. And then make sure to follow the podcast wherever you find your podcasts, whatever platform that you use, Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, Audible, we're on everything. You can find us, just search Spoon Mob or use our link tree, which you can get to through the link in our IG bio. Or usually when we put out a new episode, I post a link, direct link to it that you can click through. Um, just hit the little check mark. Once you get to your app, click the follow or subscribe button and uh, all new episodes will drop straight in your feed when they release. New episodes come out on Thursdays. They hit YouTube a week later. So you can check out our YouTube channel too as well. Put all the episodes up there for you guys if YouTube's your preferred player or whatever. But 
Without any further delays, here's my conversation with Chef Jeff Miller, the executive chef and co-owner of Rosella in New York City. Thanks again for coming on the podcast, taking some time out of your day here. I'm a big uh, fan of sushi. You know, one of my favorite things, they do it infrequently, is the Eater series. They have the omakase series that they put stuff out, but it's kind of random. They don't really have a set release date, so it's always cool to to see a new episode come out. And you had an episode in that series, which I want to get into, and your restaurant, Rosella, and everything. I always like to start at the beginning, you know, with everybody. How did you kind of first get involved with food and hospitality? I mean, I know you grew up out kind of near Sacramento in Nevada County, which is actually in California and not Nevada, as some people probably would think. I think Nevada County predates the state of Nevada. But that's a point of pride with an asterisk because I'm not certain. It's what I grew up hearing. Within Nevada County, there's my hometown of Grass Valley as well as Nevada City. And I think people from Nevada City like to stress that Nevada City existed before the state of Nevada. How did you kind of first get involved with cooking and, and stuff? Did you work in restaurants in high school or was it later on? Like when did that kind of start for you? I worked in restaurants in high school, but not seriously. I was a bus boy at a spot called Toffinelli's in downtown Grass Valley, where my brother was a legendary busboy and then became a prep cook. And my older brother cooked forever. Um, now he's in IT. It was, I think, a massive letdown at Toffinelli's because I was in the shadow of Wilson Miller. And I think they just assumed that like, maybe it was in our, in our blood or something, but I was not good at the job. I wasn't actually fired from there. I was essentially fired in the most cowardly way. I came in to check the schedule after you know, a month or so of working at Toffinelli's. I was probably 15 and um, came in to check the schedule. And my name was on the schedule, but I had no shift. And so I went outside to find the manager who was, he was out on the sidewalk sweeping. And, I, and this man who was out sweeping the sidewalk said, I don't have time to talk about this right now. But I went home and never came back. Maybe at some point they thought I quit. I think the, the message was received. So I, I, I had like a couple jobs sort of like that. Nothing serious. But then I got into restaurants seriously when I moved to Gainesville, Florida for college. Uh, I went to the University of Florida, got really lucky getting a job at a, a restaurant in downtown Gainesville called Dragonfly. I, I was still like, it was the first place I applied in Gainesville. I needed a job. My brother was still very much in restaurants at the time. Part of it was that I had fallen in love with sushi, but also I was just the competitive younger brother. And I got a job at the first place I applied, which i had heard about. It is actually a surprisingly good restaurant for the college town. It's just a good sushi restaurant. It's extraordinarily well run by two fantastic men, Hiro and Song, and Hiro's brother, Ray, who's the chef. I got a job there because the chef de cuisine thought that I was a friend of Hiro, the owner, uh, and he thought that he had to hire me. And it was just, it was just a big misunderstanding. And so I, I, I came in there for a ton, the chef, and he hired me on the spot. And I was just kind of baffled, but whatever, I just went with it. So I spent five years there moving up the ranks of sushi. I had some great teachers. It was just a lot of a lot of career chefs. It was, the, I think, the first time in my life that I really took work seriously. I like there was something so satisfying about the growth that you see cooking and in sushi, where you like you can see and you can taste the progress. And on top of that, like in love with sushi. So getting to do that all day, every day. I was also going to school, but at some point I realized like I think sushi is going to be my future. Now, before all that, though. When you were in high school, you went into a year-long exchange program that took you to Australia, right? Yeah, not, not quite a year. It was all in all of this uh, semester. In 10th grade, my high school, Nevada Union High School, home of the minors, used to have an exchange program with Radford College in uh, Canberra, the capital of Australia. And I applied for it, and I got in, ended up with a host family the Clapham's, the father of which his name is Ron. He loves to cook. He's a strange man, which this, that would be a whole, it would take a couple hours to really break down Ron. Basically, he just, he made me his sous chef when I lived in his house. He literally forced me to cook with him. And yeah, this was before any restaurant jobs or anything. So I was, I was really intimidated by all of it. He did not, not just through cooking, but in part through cooking, opened my eyes to how good food can be. Because prior to that, I was very very ordinary, safe things. You know, my mom's macaroni and cheese, which is still the best. But Ron forced me to use chopsticks when I had never used chopsticks. We were at a Chinese restaurant my first or second night in Australia, and he took my silverware away and said, if you can't eat with chopsticks, you can't eat. 
there was a very important meal for me another night. We were in an Italian restaurant. He ordered calamari for the table, and I was put off by the idea of squid. So I, I declined initially, and he sort of, in the same way, said, if you don't try it, you can't eat anything else. And so I tried it. It was just it was just calamari and marinara. The moment I ate it, I thought, like, what, what else am I missing? Because this is so damn good. Uh, and yeah, so ever since then, it's just been like food, the, the position that food had in my life changed in a wonderful way. With that exchange program, when you apply, what was the reasoning for applying? Was it just, it seemed cool? You wanted to be like, oh yeah, maybe I'll get to do this or, you know, for the experience or do you remember like the reason why you even kind of decided to enter into it? My dad would always rent Australian movies and talk about Australian culture. And he's still to this day, never been to Australia, but so I was aware of Australia in a way that I think wouldn't otherwise have been. The idea of an exchange program to Australia is pretty incredible. You don't have to learn a new language. It's like really the other side of the world. It, it, it's just like I couldn't, it seemed like such an easy yes. I don't know that I was the most qualified candidate. They would select two, in the year I went, they selected three, but they would typically select two, two people to go. I don't think I was the most qualified, but I knew one of the vice principals who was in charge of making the decision. And I just, I bugged her every day. I went to her office every day. And I, I think I was really annoying to her. But she was also the, the wife of the basketball coach there who I was friends with. I wasn't worried about being annoying. That's how it went. And then you went back after graduating high school, right? Did you go back before you started college at the University of Florida? I did. My plan was, so I, I was, all the while I was getting into sports journalism, I got a job at my hometown newspaper when I was still in high school as a sports writer. And sports journalism was going to become my career. I went to the University of Canberra. I, like, I moved back after high school to go to the University of Canberra. They have a sports media program that I, that I got into and they got into. I think they look at international students differently. Uh, international students pay full tuition, uh, which was also the reason that I ended up leaving after a semester because I just realized how much money it was going to be. Uh, so it was a tough call, but I moved back to California, worked for another newspaper for a little while outside of Sacramento, and it was pretty miserable newspaper. I felt like, okay, if I'm, if I'm going to make more of my life, like I probably have to take the steps to do that. And so the University of Florida was always on my radar. I grew up an obsessive fan of the Florida Gators and Florida also has a great journalism school. So, um, so yeah, I just hopped in my Mitsubishi Eclipse uh, convertible that I miss dearly and drove from California to Florida. So when you wind up landing a dragonfly, was that just the restaurant that was hiring that you could get a job at? Or did you specifically want to work at a sushi restaurant? I wouldn't have applied at the restaurants. I was so obsessed. I, like, I, I, had, I was so into sushi at the time. I had printed 20 resumes and I was just going to go from one business to the next. But I had heard a few people mention Dragonfly as not, not just a place to work, but like, where's good sushi in town? Like, oh, Dragonfly. It was clearly the spot. My plan had I not just been hired on the spot at Dragonfly, the next place I was going to go, because I just needed a job, was um, a place on University Avenue called Target Copy, which was a copy place. Wasn't interested in copying sheets of paper. It was the name of a business that I knew in a town that I was very new in. It could have gone very differently for me. I would not be where I am had I not been part of a misunderstanding at Dragonfly. Was it mainly uh, rolls that they were doing there, or were they doing omakase or nigiri? Or mainly rolls. There were there were forty two rolls on the menu when I started, and I'm certain that I could recreate each one day. But there's a full kitchen as well, and nigiri and sashimi were a big part of part of the menu. The one of the chefs at the time, Hiro Nagahara. Just to give you an idea of some of the people who were there, Hiro left Dragonfly be the CDC for Charlie Trotter when Charlie opened uh, in Las Vegas. He opened the restaurant within a restaurant called Bar Charlie, which was Charlie Trotter's omakase restaurant. And Hiro was the chef there. So it was this interesting mix of like, like we had a lot of fried rolls with cream cheese. Albert Roberts was our fry guy. Might still be there for all I know. He'd been making tempura for like 20 years or something at that time. And there were some Japanese guys who lived in Gainesville who would come on the days that Albert was working because like they, they thought so highly of his tempura, you know, like food was taken very, very seriously there, but at the same time, college crowd. So a lot of things there were like mass appeal, fried ice cream, things like that, which I, I think like really, I think great place to start because 
there's this other end of sushi which i get but i don't enjoy it as much where you like you take things so damn seriously you stop having fun with it where it's like oh i'm like it's just fish and rice and wasabi and soy and then technique and i i get that but being at a restaurant where the food was the food was taken seriously but not too seriously what was taken seriously was the work and the technique i learned how to make sushi and i also learned how to i learned a little bit about food that people like that like a lot of people like and that's easy to like as opposed to food that you have to like learn to like and the food that i want to make and the food that i try to make at rosella is food that is easy to like uh, i think it's good for i think it's the sort of food that i want to eat it's also it, i think it just creates a more relaxed spirit and it's just it's more fun it's just food we don't have to take it so seriously with dragonfly i'm assuming you know you were able to instead of going the traditional route where it's you know you work at a sushi restaurant for three years and then you get to touch the rice and then it's like another couple of years and then you get to handle fish you didn't have to go through any of that because you know they were a more americanized version i guess you know they weren't super traditional to the japanese kind of ways absolutely i, I spent about six or eight months my first six or eight months they're just making rice and then moved onto the line made rolls for the next two or three years and then moved up to what was called the head sushi station where you're responsible for all the fish and nigiri sashimi you're able to to get your hands on things in a way like so, so much faster than if you're going the really traditional route there's good and bad to that if you're just analyzing it based on the on, on the outcome if you spend six months making rice as opposed to years maybe you don't have the same level of control or same understanding but also like you can make rice i compare like I compare sushi and wine a lot because there's there's a level of wine that i think you can appreciate like you can enjoy like certain wines just because they taste good but there are certain wines that you can only appreciate if you have you've built the knowledge and have an understanding of where it's from and why it's good and why it's unique and the vintage and so on and i, th I think that's true for sushi too where like you can appreciate this piece of fish because you recognize like it's it's only in season for this amount of time and then like this particularly is such a good example of this fish and well like the, the the flavor of the vinegar on the rice and the size of the grains of the rice and the texture and all that and and that's one extreme and i i love eating that kind of sushi i think if you dedicate too many years to getting to that level i think you're going to end up doing what what happens in so many sushi restaurants and not just sushi but in so many sushi restaurants where you're making the same food as so many other restaurants but with very subtle differences and those subtle differences are important to the chef and important to a very small number of sushi enthusiasts i do admire people who just can can follow that but i would just get so bored doing that it would be interesting for me for a little bit but. was there a moment for you that you knew you were kind of done with the journalism path you know when you're working at dragonfly did you have that singular moment where you're like i don't want to do journalism anymore i'm going to go do sushi i'm going to do restaurants 2010 or 2011, I had an internship in Birmingham, Alabama at an ad agency where I had had a, a good friend there and I wasn't planning to get into advertising, but I just, I thought it would be like, th I thought there were some things that I could learn there that, that would help me. A few days into this internship, I was just getting so restless that I got a job at a, a burger place in Birmingham because I, I missed being in restaurants. I missed, I missed the feeling. And all of a sudden I'm like up there working two jobs and I like, it wasn't because I needed the money. It was just because I like, having wet restaurant withdrawals it was that summer that i thought like okay like I, I should probably just should probably listen to this whatever it is that i'm feeling here and it was over that summer that i it was i didn't even have to make a decision really it wasn't it was just like okay this is this is where i'm going and there was something so freeing when i did that because before then for, for a few years before before that happened there was this internal conflict of spending money and time and putting in so much effort to get this degree. And I've, I've been in journalism for years. So like, this is where I should go. But then I was like, when I was in school, all I wanted to do was get out of class. So I could go to the restaurant. And once, once I made the decision just to stay in restaurants, it was, I, I was free of that conflict. It was, I didn't have to worry about it anymore. I, I, I finished school. because I was, I was like, by that time, I think I was a semester away from graduating, but I, I knew where I was headed. Yeah, the sunk cost fallacy. You put so much time and money into something that it you just can't break yourself of thinking like, well, I have to finish this out or I have to go down this path to make it worthwhile. It is the sunk cost part of it. And I, I also, like, I really loved the work. I, I loved, I enjoy writing, certainly enjoy sports. I do, I will say I prefer being a sports fan over a sports writer. And I, 
for many reasons made the right decision. I don't don't know where I'd be now if if I stayed in sports journalism. Like, I don't really love what that world looks like so much these days. I am grateful that I got to be in newsrooms, albeit small newsrooms. When it's not like newsrooms don't exist today, but like there was I was I was in newspapers I think before before the end of newspapers as we knew them, um, when it was still so print heavy. I was I was in newsrooms when there were still like press guys coming in coming in and out of press room with like the hard like the first draft of the hard copy and you'd hear the, those like massive printers working and smell the ink and all that the energy and excitement in a newsroom and the pressure of getting your story in on deadline and all, all like not that that doesn't exist now but i love that it wasn't like i was over it completely it was just like i found so much more joy in sushi in restaurants and it was it does feel like an addiction because it was like I, it was like I, the moment I stepped away, I just had to get back in it. Did you ever consider going to culinary school at all? Or were you just kind of done with school at that point? No, I never considered going to culinary school. And it's not like, it's not like I even thought about, should I go? I just, it just never, never saw a need to. I think because in the, in the five years that I spent at Dragonfly, I learned so much so quickly. I, I didn't feel a need to look outside of restaurants. What I did look for was, the right, the right restaurant, the right chef to learn in and learn from. But no, I never, I never felt like I needed to go outside of restaurants to learn. Based on your experience, you know, if someone in your kitchen today, you know, said, Hey, you know, I want to be a chef, open my own restaurant one day. Do you think I should go to culinary school? What would you tell them? I would say, I don't know. I would say, I would ask why I would ask what you, what you hope to gain from culinary school that you couldn't gain outside of it because I didn't go. I can't speak to what I don't know. I got, I do know that it costs money um, and you can get paid in restaurants to learn. You want to learn these days with, with how much everything you can find everywhere, quality of YouTube cooking videos. And it's different than having a teacher, but like, I think I would, I would need to understand a very compelling reason why, why you'd spend money to go to go to culinary school. when there are so many chefs who are dying for good people to teach. So what happens after Dragonfly? Because at some point you wind up in Austin, I think at Uchiko, right? But is that next or is there stops in between? I spent five years in Texas working for Uchi restaurants. Uchiko is one of them. First in Houston, which was their first restaurant outside of Austin. And then I moved to Austin in 2013 to work for Uchiko, which is really where I wanted to get, get to in that company because the head sushi chef there, Masa Hamaya, so good, kind of a tough stretch working for him, but I, I came out much better on the other end. Moved up to Dallas to open the Uchi in Dallas. Far more time than I ever expected to spend in Texas. That that company, I between Dragonfly and Uchi, those ten years incredible. Like the quality of people and the quality of the food and and training, and I got to I learned I learned a lot about about how to separate separate from the food treat people and and care for coworkers and care for employees both of those uh, uchi has grown so large now and i haven't haven't been a part of it six seven years but maybe longer there's so much love in in both of those companies but i i ended up i, I came across uchi initially because I, I mentioned ray earlier the executive chef of dragonfly who is the brother of of hero the owner we were going some, I was waiting for him to shower. I was in his apartment waiting for him to shower. We were going to a bar or something after work. And while I was waiting for him, I was looking in his bookcase, and he had the Uchi cookbook, which is a, it's a, a great cookbook. And I started flipping through it, and I thought, why aren't we doing this? There's so much. If you've been to Uchi or have the Uchi cookbook, you'll know what the food is like. And it's just, it's so good, and it's so fun. It's unlike, like, at its best, it's unlike anything else. And I was just, like, flipping through page after page, like, damn. And so I remember like we like Ray got out of the shower, we went out wherever, and I remember like getting back to my apartment kind of drunk, and I immediately just went to my computer. Uh it's probably like one thirty in the morning, and I emailed Mike Enright, who is the head of HR. He's really the king of HR in that company. Emailed him saying, dying to work there. How do I get out there? Um and that that got the ball in motion. And part of the reason you wanted to work there, you wanted or we're looking for a mentor kind of w within the sushi world or. Yeah. I spent five years at Dragonfly and, and I knew that I wanted to, I knew that I had a lot more to learn. I needed, I also just needed to get out of Gainesville because Gainesville, I imagine many college towns are like this. 
get to know it so well and it's so comfortable. You know, all the bartenders, you've got a, all your regulars and it's just so easy to live there that I like seeing other people who had graduated or like almost graduated and just stuck around working at restaurants or bars, or whatever. And I, like, I saw how quickly like five or 10 years could go by and you're just like kind of there. And I really, like that wasn't the path that I wanted to be on. I wanted to, like, I, I was so addicted to the growth um, that I was seeking something beyond what, what was happening in Gainesville and in Dragonfly. And then that's where you wind up meeting Yanni Lang, who's kind of your business partner, right? You guys were both there at the same time? We met him uh, at Uchiko. Uh, he's, he's back in, in Texas now, I'm sorry to say. The three partners in Rosella, the original three partners were TJ Provenzano and Yoni and myself. Yoni was here for the first year or so, and I love New York so much. Like I, I can't understand not loving it. It's New York, and not, not everyone has the same response to it. So I think as great as Rosella is, I think it, it wasn't enough to offset the discomfort of, of being in New York City. So yeah, he and his fiance moved back to Dallas. He and I met in in Austin. We both moved to Austin to work for the same chef from Masa. Yoni Yoni's from uh, Baton Rouge, and we both formed this like very kind of, like competitive friendship around. I don't even know how to put it like competitive learning. I, it was almost analogous to like sports training or something where. Like who could get there earlier and who could get the most reps on fish and who could get their station set up fastest and so on. We bonded over those sorts of things. And then, you know, even, even after we stopped working together, we stayed, stayed in very close touch for a long time. And yeah, got back together for a while to get Rosella off the ground. So you're in Texas, you know, you're with the Uchi restaurant group there and you're opening different locations, you know, like you said, Dallas and everything. So what leads you to New York? You said you love New York, fell in love with New York, but... How does that kind of work? For me, being in restaurants, it was it was hard not to be drawn to New York, just knowing what's here. Uh, and the more I came up to visit and saw the level of, of restaurants, and um, you know, you just have your your mind blown time and time again. At some point, it became inevitable that that I would end up here. Uh, but I also just love the city, that the the energy of the city, and there's a, a sense of calm that I get from it, and it's like this thing that is constantly charging my battery. So how do you wind up at Mayanoki? You wind up in New York. That's the first restaurant that you work at before you wind up opening Rosella. So how did that all come together? How did you kind of wind up being, you know, their chef essentially and taking them from, I think there were a pop-up to kind of the brick and mortar stages. I knew uh, uh, and, and worked for briefly another outstanding sushi chef in, in New York City named John Daly. Uh, who used to have a sushi restaurant on Clinton Street called New York Sushi Co. And he put me in touch with these guys, Josh and Dave, who at the, that time were running what was a pop-up. It was a, a sushi pop-up called Mayanoki. They were going to be doing a, a pop-up out of John's space the summer of 2016, but they didn't have a chef to do it, which is, when I put it like that, it's a real, like, it's a weird, the idea of, like, running a sushi pop-up without a chef or, like, just having that idea it's kind of nuts to me. But anyway, they had this plan and they didn't have a chef. So he put us in touch and I did the pop-up for them. And then when they when they decided to turn Mayanoki into a proper restaurant in 2017, reached out. And eventually, I, I wasn't able to move up to open it, but eventually I was able to move up in November of 2017. I moved up here on a like a Monday or Tuesday. And I think my first service there was on Thursday. But the reason I remember that so clearly is because Mayanoki was just an eight-seat sushi restaurant. I was the only chef. And so the, like it was a wild time lot of work and responsibility and pressure and intensity but i ended up at Mayanoki for a few years before tj and i uh, tj was the managing partner there at that time uh tj and i split off in 2019 to open our own thing that thing became rosella which we opened in october of 2020 bring it back to Mayanoki a little bit that space after we left there was another chef in there for a while and they sold the restaurant to another goofball chef who I think he got evicted. I don't know. I shouldn't say that. Let's just say that the restaurant closed and it has been sitting vacant. TJ and I were able to get the space back and we are in the process of uh, reopening it as our omakase restaurant. So it's going to be a little eight seat omakase. And I actually, after this call, I'm going to walk over there because it's just like, it's just a couple blocks away on 6th Street between B and C because our designer, Anna Polanski, who's boy, is she good, has asked me to make sure that the 
shade of green that they're going to paint the wall is the right shade of green. So when you're at Mayanoki, and then I guess, you know, now it's going to be, you know, obviously your omakase restaurant that you're going to open here, which we'll get into in a little bit, but working as just by yourself with only one other person, is that weird? Because that's kind of counterintuitive to why people usually love restaurants is they love the camaraderie. They love being in the kitchen with all the other people and everything. And then you're just, even though there are sushi restaurants where it's just a sushi counter and everything, usually there's a couple other sushi chefs or whatever, but just being by yourself with just a beverage director is pretty like a foreign concept. It's nuts. I would never do it again. You learn a lot about yourself. Being responsible for everything forces you to, it forced me anyway to um, understand everything about everything that I was doing. The darker side of it is how lonely it can feel and how, like, if you're having a tough day, and you're in there prepping by yourself for like several hours before anyone else is in that restaurant, it's really hard to pull yourself out of whatever funk you might be in. I found myself like, I, there, were, there were days where I would, I would just would feel so dark inside of me. Part of that also is probably because I was just exhausted. There's a, a great trade-off, which is that you have control over everything. Um, whatever you want something to be, you make it. You don't, you don't have to worry about whether or not someone else knows how to do the thing that you're trying to do, because you're going to do it. That made it that made it kind of a doing that for a few years made the transition to running Rosella more challenging in some ways because I'd gotten so used to just like thinking about every task that had to be done as my task, delegating and training and explaining and like seeing the bigger picture. It took me a while to like to recalibrate and to feel like I had a healthy relationship to the restaurant and to everyone who works here. I think for a long time, it looked like I just didn't trust anyone. That was never the case. I just like, I just didn't even think about it. I didn't like, it, there wasn't like there was this, this decision, like, do I have Maya make these roles tonight or should I make them all? It was just like, oh no, like there are, there are roles coming in that need to be made. It wasn't a decision. I just, just like, okay, this, I just do, I do this, this needs to happen. So I do this. And there was, a, there was one night and Maya, Maya is a real person, uh, someone whom I'm very lucky to have here. When we opened, we were at, at the sushi bar in the restaurant. We were doing omakase, and then we, would, we had an a la carte menu for the rest of the restaurant. So I was handling all of the omakase, and then also all of the sushi a la carte. So I'm making all these rolls and handling the omakase. And I see on my right, Maya, just like very respectfully standing there watching me. And I had this sense like, what, what am I doing? Like, she's got nothing to do, and I'm a mess over here trying to keep up. And so I passed her one roll to make. And I knew that she had some sushi experience. I had never given her anything like this. It's a role. It's not like it's not like it's a huge deal. Again, I just hadn't like I was just thinking in a different way. And she made the role. It was an Arctic char and avocado. She made the role and it looked great. And I was like, good God, what have I been doing? Like, there's this completely capable person here. Like, how have I how have I not even like thought about this? That was the beginning of me getting to a point where where I was more the chef than I was a cook. That makes sense. When you guys decided to split off and do your own restaurant and open up Rosella, was that just an opportunity kind of fell into place or did you guys were wind up at kind of the point where you're like, I don't really want to work for anybody else. I want to kind of do my own thing. We knew that we worked well together and we also knew that we wanted to, to create something that could grow. We didn't see that happening at Mayanoki. When I say we didn't see that happening at Mayanoki, it was explicitly because it was because the owners were pretty clear about like, they weren't opposed to growth, but they're like, yeah, maybe in like, five years and for tj and for me like this this is our career this is it we're not that patient yeah it was it's like all right we gotta we have to start something that that we can build and that we can grow did you guys ever consider like california or was it always going to be new york no matter what california has come up many times in part because tj's other business rooftop reds uh, which is a, a rooftop vineyard and wine bar in the brooklyn navy yard there's this never-ending talk of expanding out to California. And so ca California has come up as, as a, maybe a place to expand eventually with Rooftop Reds or if that happens. But TJ is a New Yorker and I'm an aspiring New Yorker. So like, I didn't even want to leave the neighborhood, which is, yeah, we're still in the East Village. That's where I want to be. So you guys are on track to open and the pandemic happens, right? So you guys wind up opening in October, 2020, which is like seven months in the kind of the pandemic. How did you guys navigate opening during that time frame? I mean, we've had a few people on the podcast that have done the same thing where it's just, oh, we're supposed to open the doors. Like you can only delay it for so long. At some point you have to open, but how did you guys kind of navigate it? 
I'm curious what stories you've heard. For us, the, the fact that we didn't open prior to COVID was a blessing. We hadn't hired a staff. We hadn't established ourselves as one thing. We were able to make adjustments behind the scenes before people knew really what was going on. We were able to open with just the owners, most skeleton of skeleton crews, and very slowly build on that. So it was essentially like a government-mandated soft opening for six months or so. I don't know. I, I don't think COVID wasn't too great for anyone. The way that the timing worked out, if it had to happen, it was in our favor. And TJ and I, before that, like between March, September, we were we were doing um, sushi takeout of a, another of our restaurants that's in the neighborhood. So we were able to like kind of fine tune some things food wise and keep some relationships alive with friends and regulars in the neighborhood. So by the time we opened, it was like all things considered, it was it wasn't too bad. And the restaurant you guys named it after a parrot in Australia, right? Yeah, that's nod to Ron Clapham, I guess. Also, just a, you know, that's such a strong association for me. Rosellas, these beautiful red, like specifically crimson Rosellas, which is what we use in our logo, are beautiful like red and blue parrot. They're not uncommon around southeastern Australia, but in the area where I was living, when I lived with the Clapham's, they were all over. And so I, I love birds, love Rosellas. I have this very strong association of falling in love with food and these birds. And also really wanted to, I wanted to avoid any sort of Japanese sounding name as someone who is like EJ Provenzano, believe it or not, is not Japanese. And I also am not Japanese. It would have felt really uh, kind of phony if we had gone down that path. That's how we came to Rosella. So is it true the sushi counter is made from like a tree from Hurricane Sandy? Yeah, actually, that's what my hands are on right now. It fell in Red Hook uh, during Sandy and our general contractor, Amir, had it in his back pocket for the right project. Yeah, that was that was great. It's beautiful. It's a, a London plane tree, which if you're if you're familiar with the New York City Parks logo, it's a leaf. It's a white leaf in a white circle on a green background. That's the Parks logo. That leaf is the of, of a London plane tree. I can say that with such accuracy because I can see from where I'm sitting that very logo in Tompkins Square Park. If if there were any skeptics, a lot of the ingredients you use are um, from the U.S., right? Pretty much local to the Northeast. Fish from New York, Massachusetts. I think you get soy sauce from like Pennsylvania, sake from Brooklyn. Do you find those people, those purveyors, or do they kind of find you? It's a mix. More often than not, we find them. Rosella is starting to get a little more attention from those sorts of companies now. But when I was at Mayanoki, like, nobody knew what Mayanoki was. So I had to, I had to give myself a crash course in what was what, and then like very slowly add to that. Uh, but, but also, like, there's a lot going on now that wasn't going on five or six years ago. Bob Florence in Mystic, Connecticut, got Moromi Shoyu up and running, and he's making incredible soy sauce up there. White Rose Miso, which is also Kipo vinegar in Pennsylvania. They're making the rice vinegar that we use and the miso that we use. The Steelhead Trout Farm in the Hudson Valley. The Striped Bass Farm in, in Brooklyn, in Maine, just a couple weeks ago. A Yellowtail Amberjack Farm. They, they just started their first harvest after a couple years of building. There's a Coho Farm that opened recently in Auburn, New York, near the Finger Lakes. It gets easier and easier to do what we're trying to do because there are things that are there are companies that are getting off the ground that, that are making it easier for us. But in addition to that, like there's so much good seafood on the East Coast. It's just a matter of learning what's good and when and from where and learning how to use it, which I didn't I didn't know when I when I started at Mayano. Those first couple of years were tough. Like I didn't and I made so I made a mistake early on at Mayanoki of building menus based on what what I would do with other fish. Like what if I had like all of these sort of classic Japanese sushi fish. This is what the menu would look like. And then I would I would try to substitute those fish with local fish. I don't even remember what, what triggered this, but there was a, a moment when I thought, like, what if we just like look at the fish that we have for what it is and then try to like do let's let's do the most with, with this fish rather than pretend that it's something else. My life got so much easier after that. And I think the food started getting better really quickly. But yeah, like that's the perspective that I that I take for the restaurant in general is like let's embrace what is and not spend too much time worrying about what we don't have because we're not bringing in things from Japan. And that's, I don't, that's not a, a statement against 
restaurants or, or chefs who do that. It's just not what I want to do. So like a big thing you guys do, you use NOAA and the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch as like a guideline for what fish are available that are sustainable, right? So how does that work? Is that just a website with a list and you can kind of go look through it and they like update it periodically? Or like, how do you actually use those two programs? It's it's really not that hard. They both are references. So we're considering bringing in black sea bass from Rhode Island. You can just go to the like the Seafood Watch website or open the app and type black sea bass. And then you look at the different origins that they have provided and then the different catch methods. That'll tell you where this product stands in terms of sustainability as rated by Seafood Watch. They make it pretty easy. One thing that makes also makes like doing what we're doing here in that regard specifically uh, a little easier is that most like I, the, the U.S. has, if not the strictest among the strictest fishing regulations on the planet. If you're going to be looking for sustainable seafood, this is a good place to start. So pretty much you guys don't import anything, right? Everything's U.S. based. There are a few things that that we import, like nori. There's still there's some like higher end Japanese sakes that TJ brings in. Not much else. Do you work with freshwater fish much at all, or is that something that you're open to if it gets to that point? Or we don't in general. We would have to book it or freeze it really hard. There's so many good fish that we have to choose from that it's what are we okay leaving off because we can't. I can't put all the fish that I want on the menu. So is the main difference? I'm assuming really between freshwater fish and saltwater fish just flavor profile. Or is it me to texture or uh, freshwater fish, specifically wild freshwater fish, are exposed to bacteria and parasites that are uh, toxic to humans that don't live in salt water. That's the primary distinction and why you're not typically going to eat uh, freshwater fish raw. That's why like the FDA requires wild salmon to be frozen for a certain amount of time at a certain temperature because Wild salmon, even though they're caught often in salt water, spend part of their lives in fresh water, and so may still have may, may, they may still be harmful. Like you, you could still get sick from eating uh, raw wild salmon if it's not treated properly. The way you guys have it set up in there, you got like a wine bar with like an a la carte menu on like one side, and then I think on the other side is a tasting omakase counter. We eliminated, it's all a la carte now. As it got busier and busier, we ended up eliminating the omakase portion of it just because it was like running two styles of service was difficult enough when it was, you know, like limited capacity. Once we were able to go like full volume, we just had to focus on one style of service, one menu. So do you guys still have the patio? Yep. We're, it's this like never ending waiting game of is is the city ever going to make some sort of final decision on them? But like in the in the meantime, we have three, four tops out there that we're going to keep as long as we're able to. So how often do you change the menus? It changes pretty much every day, but sometimes the change is very minimal. Like yesterday, the only change that I made to the menu was switching from a mandarin marmalade on the carrot cake to a strawberry jam. That was it. Some, some days there are bigger changes. Seasonally, like going from winter to spring, like that's when we'll take take certain dishes off and put new dishes on. The format stays roughly the same. Sashimi dishes with their elements and salads, sushi and sashimi, rolls, some noodle soups, and then a, a few desserts. And of course, the fish sausage slider, which I think is, I think that's really my future is the fish sausage slider. It's something that we, when we break down fish for sushi, we take all the trim and chop it into like this big mess of chopped fish mix. Form that into little sausage patties, give that a good hard sear and, and serve it on a Hawaiian roll. I think if, if I can figure out how to just make a little fish sausage slider window, we'll clean up, but sit tight. A lot of sushi restaurants use the bycatch, you know, as part of their contribution to sustainability, but you guys mostly avoid it, right? No. And on principle, like I embrace bycatch. It's just by the nature of it, it's harder to, hard to get your hands on because so much less of it makes it to market. But we have relationships with certain purveyors like Greenpoint Fish in Brooklyn. They'll get these like one-off fish or view of something random, and they know that we're into that. So it's, there, there are times where they don't even have to ask. It'll just, it'll just be a box waiting for me when I get in of whatever, whatever random fish. 
But the like the idea of, of steering clear of bycatch is kind of silly to me. Unless the fish is not worthwhile, you're pulling it out of the water. What else are you going to do? You're either going to use it or it's going to become trash. The format that that exists at Rosella is it makes it really easy to swap certain fish out for for others. That's something that like figuring that out made my life so much easier. Like creating a template where this like white fish can replace another white fish or like just something milder can replace something else milder. As long as the quality is good, you don't have to think so much every day. It's just that you just take good care of, take good care of the fish, take good care of the products. Big portion of what you guys do is you basically adapt Japanese methods, some might call it traditions, preparation methods, ingredients to American fish. So what all does that entail compared to your edamai style restaurant that's you know super traditional and, and kind of how they're doing things i think we'll see a lot more of that when bar miller opens there like when we can get in like the late fall when we can get really good um mackerel in the northeast we'll we'll use the classic salt and vinegar curing method for the mackerel for, for local um flounder we'll use kelp to to cure those so we end up with like that classic homojime the, the further down this path that I've gotten, the less dependent on those techniques I've become. Like there, there are like I think the real staples of the sushi menu now are pretty far removed from that. The newest of which is a mussels, mussels nigiri. We're getting mussels from Prince Edward Island, pickling them. We like steam them in sake and then shuck them, salt them for about a half hour, hold them in uh, chardonnay vinegar overnight, and then transfer them to olive oil. And then we make a, like a gunkan style nigiri out of that. So a- anyway, I use that example to say like there are times where we we'll use more classic preparation methods, but I'm having more fun just like not partly just because I already know how to do that stuff. And I like seeing what else I can add to the menu that's different. Rice is the most important part of sushi. So without giving away anything, any secret ingredients or recipes or anything, what makes yours unique and how long did it take for you to come up with kind of your perfected rice recipe? Because like there's some people that, you know, they start off with short grain and then it eventually goes to, you know, long grain and they're playing around with a bunch of different stuff. So what did that kind of all entail for you to come up with this ideal rice that you have now? It was, it was a few things. It was p- partly it was the years at Mayanoki of like being able to make, make smaller batches. When you're in larger restaurants and you're making these huge batches of rice, it's much harder to, you're thinking about it differently. You're not thinking about, like you're just you're just trying to get it done. Um, then you switch from making six quart batches or ten quart batches at a time to making single quart batches, and and all of a sudden, on top of that, like I'm controlling the the recipe for the sushi vinegar. So do I want it sweet or not? Or do, do I want to use vinegar with sake leaves or not? And then of course, like what grain do I want to use? Part of it, part of it also is just like what good product will I have constant access to, so that I don't have to don't have to be like thinking on my feet too much with rice because rice if you ever if you ever have an off day with rice in a sushi restaurant the rest of your day is just kind of it's a it's a sad day you're going to be a grump and i i, I will add that like i still mess around with rice there's a uh, um a farm in the hudson valley that grows a great rice but it's just a lot harder to work with so i'm still playing with that but there's a california grain that's our that's our constant that's, that's our that's what we use in rosella getting the texture right was just a matter of lots and lots of like weighing and rinsing like different amounts of rinses different water levels it's like fairly simple it's just like th- there aren't that many factors it's just a matter of like how you tweak those factors uh, and then what made it really easy for us was when when keep well vinegar started making rice vinegar out of carolina gold rice which is delicious vinegar and on top of that it allowed me to stop having to order japanese rice vinegar which that, of course like rice vinegar from japan is good it, it just it just is a much better fit for what we do to use a rice vinegar made in Pennsylvania. It, it's um, to be able to do that is amazing. Like that, that's a pretty new thing to be able to do. It is, it's pretty acidic. So we cut it with like 25% sake. And then it's just, it's just sake, vinegar, and salt. A, after working in two restaurants that use really sweet rice vinegar to season the sushi rice, I just wanted, wanted something just very simple and not like, I, I get why that sweet rice is appealing. I just don't enjoy it as much. There's no sugar in our sushi vinegar. It's it's just rice vinegar and sake and salt. Yeah, and that's it. And then and then uh, a lot of a lot of care for the for the technique itself. So Bar Miller, your forthcoming uh, restaurant here, that's going to be the 
Still eight seat counter, or is it going to be a little bit bigger? Still eight seat counter, okay. Eight seats. More than one chef in there, or just one chef? James, who works at Rosella currently, he's going to be the chef over there. Um, they'll have an assistant, and then in addition to that, next door in the old grape and grain space, which is going to be a, a different concept. Part of that is going to be dedicated. It's going to be a dedicated prep kitchen. So he's going to have somebody in there with him during service and also a prep team behind him. The goal is to, to create a business to, to have a good restaurant that doesn't require a chef to be on the verge of burnout at all times. So I'm assuming that other, the, the prep kitchen, are you guys exploring like takeout to go options out of that third? Yeah, that's, it's going to be called TJ's Sushi Deli. Uh, it's going to be sushi takeout as well as retail fish, seafood. That's not going to be the focus. I think like sushi takeout is going to be the, the main part of that. But if somebody wants fish, we will cut them pound or whatever from whatever fish we have. Um, and, and see how that goes. We'll also sell like all the condiments that we make for the restaurants, sushi, rice, vinegar, soups, all of it. Any, basically anything that we make for the restaurants that you can buy for, for your home. It's kind of like a market component almost. Exactly. Yeah. So with sushi to go, obviously you guys had to do that during the pandemic, uh, kind of from people that I've talked with in the sushi industry, mixed bag of, we did it because we had to do it. Didn't really like doing it, but it was a necessity at the time with to go sushi. Is it a longer shelf life than your normal to go food? Is there much that you have to kind of figure out in terms of how you keep it the same flavor as if you were in the restaurant once you get it home kind of 30, 40 minutes? I don't, I don't worry about that too much. Um, what we'll eliminate is things that don't travel as well. Like try to stay away from uh, like nigiri and sashimi, things that are really like temperature dependent or more delicate in favor of rolls rice bowls, things that are also a little easier to assemble and easier to eat. And I'd say this is someone who really enjoys like, takeout sushi. I just try to think about like what I, what I would enjoy eating, what I would have an easy time eating on my couch, and then like make, make that. I understand why, why people don't like making it. And during, you know, when, when people were forced to during lockdowns and that, I think the people who did well were ones that like had fun with it as opposed to like grudgingly putting their prized Kohada into a to-go box. I think also going through what we went through in the five or six months or however long it was between the start of, of the pandemic and opening Rosella, we have a really good sense for what works as, as takeout and what doesn't. So it's going to be, it's going to be pretty easy to, to build that menu. So are you going to mostly spend your time at Rosella or are you going to spend it at the new place or split between? This is, this is a great question. I don't know. It, ideally, I'm just like bouncing around. So much of it is just going to depend on on the staffing situation of any given restaurant. Do you have a preference between the two menu concepts, a la carte versus omakase? Do you prefer one or the other, or do you prefer working on one or the other? It doesn't does not matter to you. Uh, if I'm making the food myself, I would prefer prefer the omakase format because I I love I spent I spent so long in high volume restaurants that switching to that omakase format where you can spend a little more time on on refinement on on the detail I, I love that i love the energy of a busy restaurant i love the energy of a loud restaurant it's, that's why like rosella is set up as this one big bar basically the music is loud i love that energy so in terms of making food wakase but in, in terms of like where i want to be it's it's any busy restaurant so last year you uh, had a appearance on the Eater's YouTube channel with a maybe like 10, 12 minute uh, video that they did as part of their Omakase series with you. They kind of highlighted as you uh, doing Tamago. How long did it take you to, to learn how to do that and perfect that? We'll say Maya, who I mentioned earlier, I think she's, she's gotten better than me in a matter of like six weeks. So I'm just letting her make all the Tamago now. And that sounds like a joke, but it's really not. I don't, I don't understand why she's so good at it. Um, a part of it, part of it was such a like when I when I started to make tamago when I was at Dragonfly, it was really difficult for me, largely because I didn't know how to cook. You can be a sushi chef for a very long time and not do much over a burner. But all of a sudden, then like I mean, it's not like tamago isn't just cooking something on a burner. It's like this very, it's this very like tedious. It's just not an easy thing to cook. So I went from like cooking nothing to cooking this very difficult thing, 
And it was, it was just a mess for a long time. It was like oil and egg everywhere all the time. Yeah, I, I don't know if I can answer like how long it took me. I just like, I'm better now than I used to be. And I'm happy with the product. I'm happy with the dish that we use the Tamago for, which is called the eggs galore, which is, I, I love warm Tamago, like, like freshly made Tamago, but it's, it's a long, it's, it's not, a, not something that you want to make to order. We just we cut off a block of the Tamago and warm it in brown butter, finish it with maple syrup from Vermont and then caviar from the Sturgeon Caviar Farm in Northern California. It's a real winner. I think I'm more proud of that dish than I am of my Tamago technique. You're kind of labeled as the sustainable sushi chef. Rosella's is kind of labeled as the sustainable sushi restaurant, right? Do you get tired of that title, that moniker where like, yeah, it's great, but like we do more than just focus on sustainability or is it just kind of like it comes with the territory and you're happy with, you know, being kind of the point person in the sustainability and sushi movement? I don't think about it that much. I love that, love that you can come into this restaurant and have a meal here and leave without any knowledge of it. Um, it can be part of the restaurant in the same way that like cleaning, cleaning at the end of the night can be part of a restaurant. It's just, it happens, can make everything better, but it's not like, we're not, we're not telling our guests about our cleaning practices. You're not hitting them over the head with the whole, not everything is just sustainable, sustainable, sustainable in like their face kind of thing. Like that's a big part of what you do, but you're not like, well, you know, the way that we caught this and, we, and going into like so much detail that it's like mind numbingly like overwhelming kind of. Yeah. I mean, re- restaurants, restaurants exist for pleasure. And I, I just don't, I don't think, I think most people would gain pleasure from hearing us talk about good or bad fishing practices. Um, that's not to say that if, if people ask, we're, we're an open book. I, and I like personally care about it and I don't like, I, it's important that it isn't. Like what I care about is making good food. I just don't, I, I want to make good food to the best of my ability with the best products I can. Yeah. The, you put the onus on the person if they have a desire for more knowledge on the practices. I think it's a better way that I should have said it earlier. You can alienate people too. If you, if you bring up sustainability and someone doesn't know anything about it, it I, th- I think there's a, a very good chance that, that they're going to feel alienated or like, like they're they're being judged or like like we think that we're we're better than restaurants that that don't factor in the same things like that's not it like it's just like we're doing things the way that we want to do them but that's that's not a a judgment of of anyone else or of any of any other restaurant it's just how we want to do it this is something that a few people have run into especially in the sushi industry food appropriation you know what's your take on it because you're a white dude making sushi and to some people it's well, there's no way that you know anything about sushi. Why are you making sushi? And blah, 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 blah. You're from California. Like, you're not using Japanese ingredients, really. Like, what is this? But on the other hand, it's you spent 10, 15 years working in sushi restaurants. Like, you've learned from people who have, have both the traditional techniques down and that have taught you. And you know those things. But that's just not what you're choosing to implement now because you enjoy a different way of of doing it. So what's your kind of take on that? Viewing human beings, sharing, sharing cultures, sharing cultural traditions and practices. I think viewing that as appropriation is such a cynical look. I think like the, the best, the best of, of humans, the best of what we can do, it, it is, it is sharing, sharing what we have. And I think, I, I think also there's, there's something implicit in the idea of, of appropriation that, that suggests that someone is being harmed by someone else's success. I don't think that's the case. And I, I think if there's an example where that's the case, there's something else going on. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it's worth taking too seriously. I, I think it'll make, I think if you spend too much time like worrying about that stuff, it'll make you unhappy. Um, and um, I don't know, you know, I, I don't, I personally don't worry about it. I know what, what it took to get where I am. And I know the respect that I've had for, Japanese tradition, and I know the respect that I've earned from the chefs whom I've worked for. I think, I think as I think as long as we're approaching one another with respect, and love, and care, I, I, we can all win. Like it's a it's a win win win. Is blue fish still your favorite fish to work with? Yeah, I just wish it. I wish it were around longer, but it is. It's like blue fish, like late late summer, early fall blue fish. 
maybe I mean maybe it's maybe I feel that way also because it's a, a shorter season. I wish it were more widely known. I wish that there was something being made, and maybe this will come. I think if it were more more widely known, if there were a, a bigger demand for it, there would be more of an effort to form it and find ways to have this thing available year round because it's it's this amazing mix of like it has the, just the very beginning oily qualities of a mackerel, but at the same time it's got the delicate sweetness of like a yellowtail, and there's almost there's a, sort of a, a hint of the like the tuna iron flavor in there. It's but it's all very it's all very subtle, and then they get so rich and fatty. It's one of the great sushi fish, and it's just not a, not a, not everyone knows it yet. Yeah, I've never had it as a sushi fish. I grew up on Cape Cod, and back in I'm dating myself here. I mean, I'm 34, but back growing up in like the late 90s, you know, when you're a kid, had a summer camp, and one of the things we would do is we would go on like a fishing charter, and pretty much, you know, they have fishing charters in Provincetown. They're still there today one of the things basically go for three different types of fish your flounder fluke as some people call it your sea bass and then they would get bluefish and you would basically just use you wouldn't even use any bait it was just a silver shiny hook and you're just bouncing it up and down trying to attract them and they'll come grab it i remember we caught one and a lot of people you get tourists and stuff like that um, who go out for the day or whatever but you can keep the fish but a lot of them wouldn't, if they caught a bluefish, they wouldn't keep it because they didn't know what to do with it. Nobody knew how to prep it. We actually got a recipe from like one of the boat captains who had one because we caught one and it was all these different ingredients to like pull the oil out and you have horseradish and all this stuff. So this is something that I've heard this over and over, like I've heard versions of this over and over and I just don't get it. Like I don't, I'm not sure what it is that people are so worried about. It's like you can, you can treat it like any other fish. You can cook it. Uh, it's like a, it's a fantastic cooked fish. It has more flavor than you know. Striker is a white fish, and it's just you know in general, white fish are the most mild flavored fish. But it's it's fantastic. It's not like it's not off putting. There's never once been a time when I've served someone bluefish in any like whether it's raw or cooked. Anyone's anything other than happy about it. Nobody ever and like bluefish is when it's on the menu. It's one of the most reordered fish that we serve. So maybe it's because like. Oilier fish tend to spoil faster than leaner, less oily fish. So if you're not storing it properly, it's it's going to go bad faster, and then it's going to be disgusting. That's not the fish's fault. Don't blame don't blame the bluefish. Learn how to treat a fish right. Just get it cold, keep it dry. It's going to be good. Yeah, I think I think a big component of it is people don't understand what that fish is. Like they just don't encounter it enough. Like. You're not going to find that, you know, a supermarket outside of somewhere on the Northeast coast. And even then you're not going to find much of it probably. Yeah. I grew up in, you know, it's like essentially it was a Portuguese fishing village back in the day. And even locals, there's people that wouldn't, they're like, yeah, I don't eat that. I don't want. So yeah. And I don't think it's really evolved that much in the 20 some years since that happened, you know, there are people, there are people who come in from like long Island for dinner and they'll see bluefish on the menu and they'll say like, like you can serve me anything, but just no bluefish. Just like, what do you think is going to happen to you? Like, what do you, do you think we're just out here? Like, we don't give a fuck. Everyone's eating bluefish. Like it's disgusting, but like, I don't care. It tastes good. I, 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 ju- I don't get it. I don't get it. Do you have a recommended like preparation method? Like not for the bluefish sushi, but like if you were going to grill it, like what, and people caught one, you know, and they're like, oh, let's throw it on the grill. Like, do you have a recommended? The simpler, the better. I will say. The fattier the fish, the better. So, like, get it, get it during late summer, early fall when they're when they're at their richest. Uh, and then, like, olive oil, lots of black pepper, salt, little lemon juice. Like, just keep it simple. Um, if you, and this this is true for most any fish, if you can let it rest for a couple of days, again, like keeping it cold, keeping it dry, let it let some of that extra moisture evaporate inside of the meat. You'll get a more concentrated texture, like less mushy. It's only going to get better. But beyond that, just keep it simple. It's also a great fish, like in ceviche. Like if you're worried about like a strong fish flavor, eating it raw is probably the best thing you can do because the cooking cooking a fish only concentrates the flavor, brings out a lot more flavor in the meat. If you eat it raw, it doesn't taste like much. So it's a great fish to use in ceviche because it it will adapt to most anything. Why is this question to everybody uh, who's a sushi chef who comes on? Lab grown fish is coming. Would you work with it if it becomes more popular, more mainstream? If it's good, 
some people are anti. So I, I'm always curious to get, you know, cause there's that company, I think they're out of Virginia and they got like, they're growing lab grown fish and stuff. So some, somebody, somebody gave us a sample like last year, a couple years ago. It was not good. Um, but if it's good, why not? What did it taste like? It wasn't so much the flavor as the texture. It was like, if you combined fish and like soft tofu with like an element of like xanthan gum, not good. That's not a great texture. No. <laughs> uh what's next for you professionally i mean obviously you got bar miller you're working on you got the kind of market to go uh, that you guys are kind of working on so i'm assuming getting those ready and everything do you have a targeted opening date or anything early july for bar for bar miller uh the sushi deli a little bit after that we have we're we're partnering we licensed rosella to um a company called eos they're they're based here but they've got uh properties up and down the east coast we're opening a, a Rosella in Maine with them around Memorial Day, like early June is when that's going to open. That's going to be really interesting to see. It's, a, it's ours, but it isn't. Conceptually, it's ours. We have the control over food and, and how it, like, you know, I'm, I'm overseeing the chef. TJ's overseeing the beverage side in the front of house. But at the same time, it's, it's not ours. So uh, it's a really interesting path. Like, it's a, I'm, I'm very curious for how this all plays out. It's, uh, I mean, they're great people. They've done extraordinary things for us so far so i think i think it's going to go well it's opening in kenny bump board in maine that's the first new thing for us so tj and i'll go up there for a couple weeks when it opens and then check in a few times a year and then i'm assuming they'll probably try and keep it new england northeast probably just because of all the ingredients that you guys use right like the concept can adapt to most anywhere and you know, we use a lot of fish from the southeast during like certain times of year it's adaptable it, assuming it goes well and i think it will i think they'll try to grow it more it's just a matter of like whether we want to go that route with them or not so we'll, we'll see my focus right now of course like going to take maine very seriously but i'm more interested in growing rosella within new york the more the more time i spend here the more i love it here whether it's like going to the west village or to brooklyn or something like that um like none of none of this is anything other than in in my head right now so maybe like 2027 so this next question comes from previous guests on the podcast, Isabella Vanello, uh, who's the head baker owner of Three Bites Bakery here in Columbus, Ohio. She left behind a question for you. What do you think is the most important conversation the food industry needs to have? These, these are really difficult questions for me because I, I understand the urge to think about the restaurant industry as one thing. I think there's a risk in, in doing that that removes individual responsibility from the equation. And I'm not suggesting that that is at all buried in that question that you just asked, but I think thinking about the restaurant industry as one thing can lead to that. The, the responsibility, and, and I say that because when these things come up, there tends to be discussions of like problems within the, the industry, which do exist. The only way to solve that, whatever, whatever problem you see, the only way to address that, that we as individuals Whatever it is that we want to fix or whatever it is that we want to create, we have to do that. We, we have to start that to the degree that we can in our restaurants. That, I think that's the only way to make any, any sort of real change. Otherwise, it's just talking about problems that the industry has. I say this as someone who's like, watch these conversations go on for a long time. You know, it's, I've, I haven't been in this forever, but, you know, I've been in restaurants for like seriously for six, 16 years. And, and these, these are, these are, opposite ends of the spectrum. And so like, there are obviously things that fall within the spectrum that, that run counter to this. But on one end of the spectrum, you have people talking about problems in the industry. On the other end of the spectrum, you have chefs and restaurateurs creating brilliant restaurants, treating their staffs well, doing it right. And I think look to those people, celebrate, celebrate those people and create the world that you want to live in. That's the only way to live. Sometimes the topic of the conversation is generalized across the entire industry where maybe people need to be having conversations that are specific to the problems that they're facing and that and that's where i say like i think you can sometimes some of these conversations lead people to fail to take responsibility or or maybe not even recognize that they have they have power to make the change that they want to make but they maybe you can't make it on the scale that you want to make it maybe you can't make it on the scale that you want to make it right away if you see something happening industry-wide and you have the power to change that in your restaurant or on your team in your restaurant. You start there and and cr like set the example. Maybe people follow you, maybe they don't. But at the very least, you've created the exception to that. You whatever it is that you see going wrong, whatever it is, you know it doesn't have to be that way. Like there's no there aren't rules to this. There's no like you don't open a restaurant 
and then receive a set of rules of how to run a restaurant. Individuals making decisions. What's the question you want to leave behind for the next guest? Can be anything. I see a pretty clear distinction in restaurants between people who love the work. They love, they love the process of getting through service, whether it's making food or taking care of guests, pouring drinks, whatever. There are people who love that. And then there are people who just have come to work, they show up, and they could even be great at their job. They clock in, clock out, probably don't love being there. What's the difference between those two people or between those two categories of people? And I ask that because I, I think, think it's a choice. And I, 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 I like really deeply think it's a choice. I'm telling you this. I don't, I don't know that um, everyone's going to see it that way. But um, I, I can't imagine for, for what restaurants require of you. I can't imagine staying in restaurants if you didn't love the process. If you didn't love getting to work and getting the restaurant open and going through it every day. Next question comes from one of our listeners. They wrote in, what is the worst thing you've ever eaten? I mean, that my old chef, Masa, the one who I worked for in Austin, made me eat. It was um, dried uni. I like uni. It was dried uni. I will not say out loud what it tasted like. It's, it was so bad that it's like, it's not even a question. By far the worst thing I've ever eaten. I can remember exactly, I can remember everything about that moment. It was, it must have been a joke. Like he has a sick sense of humor. But he, in, he, invited, he invited me over for Christmas with his family and in front of all of them just gave me this thing. He got a kick out of it. Was it just like air dried or was it dehydrated? I think it was just air dried. Last set of questions here. We ask these to everybody who comes on the podcast. So compare and contrast for the listeners across all the episodes. A little bit kind of more rapid fire style here. Who would you say is the biggest influence on your cooking career thus far when you look back on it? The chef who I mentioned, the one who went to work for Charlie Trotter, Hiro Nagahara. He's out in LA now. The reason it's tough is because there are like there are a few guys who come to mind who played really important roles, but I think I think he played the biggest. I think he was at the very least he was the most inspiring. Be someone like him and my first sushi job ever to see somebody like him like that was a big part of the reason that I got so like sucked in into that world. It's not not just the food that he made, but like how seriously he took the work. What's one kitchen item that's not a knife that you can't live without? Chopsticks, specifically like saibashi, their their cooking chopsticks. You can also use them for plating. There's like a level of intimacy and control connection to what you're cooking when you're when you're using those things to be cooking something in a pan or noodles or whatever. Restaurant you recommend that isn't your own. So scenario you usually give a person gets stuck at the airport overnight. They reach out to you. Hey, where should we go eat? You guys are closed. You point them in this direction. Sushi Noda. It's my favorite sushi restaurant in New York. Very, very different than Rosella. It's omakase only. The chef is Shige Sunoda most talented, kindest sushi chef in this city. Bucket list travel destination, bucket list restaurant. So a place you have not visited yet, but you still want to go to. Restaurant you have not dined at, but you still want to eat at one day. Probably not a surprise here, but St. Peter in Sydney. What Josh Nyland has been doing down there, I'm not sure when they, when they were like 2016, 2017. I have every reason to go back to Australia. That's probably the top of the list. Craziest thing you've seen happen in a restaurant while you're working? Uh, another sushi chef, this is at Uchiko in Austin. It's an accident. Another sushi chef, Shannon, got stabbed in the stomach. She's fine. Got stabbed in the stomach by a chef who was handling a knife ir- irresponsibly. Is it because, cause, like, they're pretty close in, like, the counter box, whatever you want to call it, that they're kind of in? Because it's kind of one way in, one way out. Was it, like, wrong turn kind of situation? It was John, the, the chef who stabbed Shannon, was using his Yanagiba, his knife, to transfer fish like some sashimi from in front of him to the station behind him which he shouldn't have been doing and he was like he was turning quickly as shannon was also like moving behind him or it was yeah as shannon was moving behind him to to do something else to drop off another dish and he just got it right in the stomach food or drink guilty pleasures or anything fast food candy whatever that you know is unhealthy for you but you just can't help yourself taquitos at 7-eleven cheese it's I, I should have listed cheese it's first based on like Based on the amount consumed, Cheez-Its probably like 10,000 to one, preferably the extra toasted Cheez-Its. What is the one cookbook that you think everyone should own? Home chef, professional chef, they should have this regardless of what their status is. This is not exactly a cookbook in the same vein. It's American Seafood by Barton Seaver. Came out probably five years ago. I get one for everyone who works here or for everyone who works here in the kitchen. Probably should just get one for everyone. I always keep one here. It's like A to Z. Every fish, shellfish that you can cook with from the waters of North America has been so valuable for me. And it 
it's also just an amazing book. It's not just a list of them. It's for, for, for a lot of them, it goes into their historical importance. There are like cooking recommendations for most of them, but it's a, especially in the early years of doing this, when I switched from like using primarily Japanese fish to North American fish, it was essential. I, like I didn't know what I was working with. And so, and then I had this book that I could just like look up anything and, and put it into, uh, I would, I would gain the, what's the word? Anyway, I would, all of a sudden, be able to talk about it and understand it. Yeah, American Seafood by Barton Seaver. Favorite dish thing you ever cooked, created, kind of looking back on your career, this would be like your aha moment. Like you knew you could be a professional chef one day, you know, once you made this. That's a really tough one to answer. But like the first thing that comes to mind is when I, it was the first roll that I made for an order at Dragonfly. It's a roll called the Gator Roll that I'm sure has been taken off the menu by now because the menu at Dragonfly has changed pretty drastically. The Gator Roll had cream cheese, avocado, tuna, and salmon. That, that's it. I made it. It was, a, again, the first roll that I ever made like for an order at Dragonfly. And I made it, cut it, and I plated it, sent it out, and I was so proud of myself because it was like, oh, I'm a sushi chef. Like, I have made sushi that somebody else is going to eat. Like, somebody's paying for this roll. Made it, and I turned to my right to Chef Kai, who uh, he's a, I loved working next to him. He taught me a lot. I was so proud of myself. I turned to Kai, and I say, I, I just made my first gator roll and he looked at me and then he just got back to work. That was, I went from being like so proud of myself. just like, Oh, I guess it wasn't that big of a deal. Last question. I'm an Anthony Bourdain fan, but not everybody is, or was, uh, if you were, is there a moment episode scene that stands out to you about him? Or if you weren't, is there another culinary personality, Emeril, Yen Ken cook at a TV show, Jacques Pepin, Julie child, somebody who was on TV, culinary personality that you kind of gravitated towards coming up through your career. Well, I, will say, I think I can answer both. I think an underappreciated show, maybe because it's more regional, is uh, Real Food with Mike Colomeco. Or, I mean, it's hard to think of one moment from, from Bourdain's shows. They're, they're just like, like scenes that I remember so clearly. Sean Brock and Bourdain getting drunk in a Waffle House and Sean Brock proclaiming that Waffle House is better than French Laundry. And like Bourdain eating sushi with Yasuda in Tokyo. It's like a, a level of appreciation for it. But also like, in just like the such a beautiful Bourdain way, like just no bullshit about it at all. Just it wasn't making it more than it was. It's it's too difficult to like. I could probably go on about like just listing scenes for a long time. Where can people find you? Social media, website, reservations, plug everything. I would definitely start with my very engaging Instagram account, Jeffrey Peffrey, spelled exactly as it sounds. Really, if you can come eat at Rosella, RosellaNYC.com reservations are on resi easy to find you guys are open during the week wednesday through sunday five to ten right i'm sure you guys will post about it but i guess be on the lookout for bar miller opening this summer oh we're gonna post about it boy are we i'm sure you'll have a separate uh instagram handle and all that stuff too as well going live yeah no this is awesome i think what you're doing is super unique it's super different and it's still sushi with overfishing and all the logistics and costs of goods, you know, flying stuff in from Japan, you know, that stuff's great, but finding ways to use for more local fish uh, and still make delicious things out of it is um, super intriguing, super unique. And I think it's kind of going to have to be the path a lot of people kind of start to move down towards because there's only so many tuna in the ocean. It's getting easier and easier. I, you know, the, the future is bright in that respect. It's not as hard as I thought it would be. I will say just like as a business, one of the beautiful things is that like people don't really care too much where their fish is coming from as long as it's good. It's not hard to find good local fish. And there's a reason why every new year at the Japanese fish auction, there's the highest that the tuna has ever sold, you know, the, or the opening year. Like there's a reason for that. It's not just because it's because they're dwindling in population, but uh, yeah, looking forward to Bar Miller opening and the expansion with Rosella and everything. So be keeping an eye on that. And, you know, when we're back in New York, we'll be stopping in and hopefully trying out both concepts, thinking around with uh, some ideas for some trips. Um, I have a sushi trip. Uh, I got a book that my wife kind of gifted me for Christmas. So I got to pick some stuff and pick a time frame. But uh, yeah, definitely looking forward to stopping in and um, trying a bunch of stuff. Yeah, let me know. Let me know. We'll be here. Big thanks again to Jeff for coming on the podcast, taking some time out of his day. He's got a lot going on with the new concepts, getting those ready, 
also just running Rosella, the expansion of Rosella into Maine and, and possible other locations too as well. So super busy guy, super thankful that he was able to make time for us and come on the podcast and chat about his career and sushi and the industry where it's headed. So again, you can follow him on Instagram at Jeffrey Peffrey and also follow the restaurant at Rosella Sushi. Follow us on Instagram too as well at Spoon Mob. Check out our website, SpoonMob.com, and then make sure to follow the podcast on whatever platform that you use so all new episodes drop straight in your feed as they release. But that is it for this week. Appreciate everybody who's been listening. Appreciate all the new listeners. If you're newer uh, or relatively new or whatever, thank you for uh, being here and hope you've been enjoying the episodes thus far. Make sure to go through the back catalog when you get some opportunity. There's a lot of good stuff back there. We're at uh, almost 120 episodes now. So there's a lot of different opinions and viewpoints and experiences that you can uh, go back through the catalog and listen. And if you've been here for a while, uh, make sure you've listened to all the episodes. If you have thus far, thank you. Appreciate you guys' continued support and listening and continue to help spread the word. When you wind up at one of the establishments that we featured on the podcast, make sure to let them know that you heard their episode on the Spoon Mom podcast too as well. Uh, just help support them. Uh, we try and support everybody as much as we can and reshare any updates uh, that they put out on Instagram, whether it's uh, special event dinners or new locations or new concepts, whatever. And we try and update the website to um, keep that all up to date when people move about to either open a different concept or move to a different restaurant, whatever. So we always kind of want to be that one-stop shop platform for people in the hospitality industry to come on and tell us you know, what they got going on and keep everybody up to date. So there's always an open invitation for anybody to return who's been on the podcast, whether they got uh, some career updates or whatever. Uh, we have a handful of people that have come back on and a couple more episodes uh, from some people too as well. So we always want to continue those partnerships uh, as much as we can uh, too as well because they do awesome things and you know we want them to continue to have success so we can continue to experience those awesome things for ourselves because that's just something that we like to do. That is it for this week. Mini update episode next week, which is really cool. Uh, it's an interesting concept, brand new concept coming here to Columbus. I'm pretty excited for it. I didn't really know too much about it. I kind of stumbled upon it. And then the person who is heavily involved with it reached out and was like, hey, I want to talk about this. I was like, absolutely. And then just after he explained it to me, super excited for it. So that will be next week. We'll be dropping that on Thursday. But again, thank you for everybody, your continued support, continued listening. And uh, we will talk to you guys next week.